Hello, everybody. So I am Christy Craig. I'm the publisher at Hidden Timber Books. We are a very tiny press in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and um, I want to welcome you all here today for this reading. And I um, just want to let you know this small press author reading series is um, our way of kind of building a literary community with readers and writers and um, and authors and introducing you to books that you may not have heard of because you live outside of the city or region, wherever they're published, and um, authors who have some wonderful stories to share. And so, yeah, we welcome you. And I've, I've been uh, working on a couple of my initiatives, now been one word, so I'm hoping that I say them correctly, but um, Bendigan or Bendigan. Yeah, Bendigan. Oh, Bendigan. So <laughs> welcome. And I just want to introduce you to our two speakers today. Stacy Sheldon is the author of our book, The Adventures of Nimke, and I'm going to let her pronounce that official title herself so I don't mess it up. Um, she's the co-founder of Ojibwe.net, which is a really cool website that is dedicated to keeping the Anishinaabemowin language alive, and it, it's full of lessons for beginners and um, intermediate and on. It's full of songs that are really cool to listen to. You can find information about history and culture on the website. And I'll drop that in the chat box so you can take a peek if you want to. Um, but it's a great website. So she is the co-founder of Ojibwe.net. She serves on the board of directors for the American Indian Services in Lincoln Park, Michigan. And Margaret Noden is a professor at UW-Milwaukee. She is a contributor to Ojibwe.net and she herself is a poet and she is the translator for our book today. So I want to um, pass the mic over to Stacy and Margaret and let them tell you a little bit more about themselves. Well, Ani, Stacy Sheldon, Indigena Kaz, Chitwa Dwege Kwe, Indigena Kaz, Nishnebe Mong, Ajijak Dodum, Sheboygan, Michigan, in Donjaba. So I'm Stacy Sheldon. Honor beat woman is my name in Anishinaabemowin, and I'm Crane Clan, and I'm originally from Sheboygan, Michigan. And I'm at my sister's house today, and we're all with my parents, and we're all dog people. So a number of the dogs mentioned in this book, Maisie and Cooper and Roscoe, are all here. So I'm going to apologize in advance for any barking. I'll try to quickly mute myself if that happens. But we have Crazy Maisie, the young dog. And Roscoe, who's almost 15 years old, so a big range. And Nimki's actually on the floor right there, if you could see her good. But there's Nimki hanging out. Maganit, do you want to introduce yourself? Maharash, Ani, Gewed Noden Deko, Wabsheshi, the Bendagas, Che Gewed Nong, Minnesota, Nok Misabani, Konjabawa, Chijajago, Chaska, Minnesota, Onjabaya, T. Kwezen Suaya. Nongam Daya Minowaking. I am originally from Minnesota and a descendant of the Grand Portage band in far northern Minnesota, but grew up in Chaska, much more in the Ocheti Shakawan territory. But I live now and teach in Milwaukee. Apchigo in Wendan, J. Wabmagai, Kakanoya, Nongam. It's nice to see everybody here, people that I know who sing and have enjoyed our language in the past, and it's fun to meet new people as well. Thank you. Thank you, Stacy and Margaret. So um, today we are reading from The Adventures of Nimki, and uh, the Anishinaabemowin one title is long, and I don't want to mess it up, so I'm going to let the two of you introduced the title, but I'm also going to um, let Stacy and Margaret um, share their screen so that you can, as an audience, get to see some of the book as well and hear it read. And then we'll have some questions and answers and discussion about language and the art of translation and things like that. So let me make you co-hosts. We'll go, we'll read through it. It's not a long book, but then since we have a nice small group with interest in the language and knowledge in the language or, or just, you know, finding out about it, then we can take lots of questions or talk about the words we chose or how it came together. And the book is 
looks like this. I hope you guys can see it good. But I also have a, a PDF. I thought it's probably no fun to just hear somebody speaking words to you that you don't understand. But if I show this, you can see the English and the Anishinaabemoy together. Can you guys see this um, OK? Mm -hmm. OK, cool. So I'm going to read a couple of my favorite pages. And then Meg's going to read, Margaret's going to read a couple of her favorite pages. And I'm going to apologize in advance. I just got braces two days ago, so I feel like I can't talk. <laughs> um, and so this is, um, when I was writing this book, I have was keeping in mind I have a cousin who's five. And I really looked forward to reading with her. And it became clear to me that um, you know, for her, when she when she's being read to, she wants to like count everything on the page, and she wants to talk about everything that's on the page. And it wasn't just me sitting and reading a story like I maybe was imagining it would be. So I tried to write this book thinking about a ch reading what it's like to read with a child, how they're going to want to like count things and see different animals and identify things on a page. So you'll see here. I have to try to move my zoom window here. One second. Um, we have a counting raspberries exercise and butterflies on this page. So Nimki Ogi Mikan Miskomanakan, Nimki Omakawan Miskomanangaye Maminguan, Anin Minik Miskomanak Wabmadwa, Anin Minik Maminguak Wabmadwa. And then on this page, you'll see it says Wawa Tesewak fireflies at the bottom, then Awenan Wawa Tamanongwa. Awenan wawaskonesewat nibanong dibakok. Awewak wawatesewak ago. And this page is where there's an opportunity to find all the different little animals. Um, and it's in the fall season. Dagwagan minojuebuk janando kawajigat agwajing. Anin minik wijuwaganak. Nanda Wab Nangwa Megwayokong Gwab Makna Bapa Se Agongos Gak Wabos Ginawa Wawa Keshiwak Awenan Ishpabit Mitigong Ajidamo Nimki Na Bapago Inu Ajidamo. And I love this page because I think anybody who has a dog. Um, recognizes this particular scene. And then I wanted to skip ahead to one of my other favorite parts of the book. You'll get a chance to see some of the pages here, how cute they are, the illustrations for this book I, um, I adore. But I love this starry night scene here. Um, and this is actually, maybe when I finish reading this, a good translation thing to talk about. Um, Nimki, Omen Windan, Ganawabmat, Anangan Bibun. O Wabman, Winabojo, Anangan Gaye, Mayingan Anangan. Nimki Nagamo, Epas Kakano set, Epas Kakano set, Agashin Anangans. Get a Windanan, Na Nagamo Yan. So do you want to sing? Um, and we do have at the end of this book, there's the link to Ojibwe.net to let people know that they could learn how to sing the whole Twinkle Twinkle Little Star song with um, you know, whoever re they're reading, sharing the book with too. But um, maybe jumping a little bit ahead here, but Margaret, I was thinking back before this book reading about, you know, we were wanting to talk about translation and our, the woman who illustrated our book, her name is Rachel Butson. She's super talented and she's, um, she's Haudenosaunee and so she actually originally drew this page with kind of um, constellations from her tradition, from her, her heritage. And so then Margaret had to be like, I was kind of thinking about this and maybe we should, we should use some of the um, Ojibwe translations, share some of those. And so she, she drew that up for us, but I don't know Margaret, if you wanted to say more about the different constellations. Well, I think that uh, there are a lot of ways to look at the night sky. And one of the things we've tried to do um, here in Milwaukee, we have a elementary school where they're revitalizing Ojibwe, Oneida, uh, Potawatomi, 
is spoken there as well if the kids in the Ojibwe class have Potawatomi background, um, Menominee, Ho-Chunk. So we've got multiple different languages in our region and we're trying really hard to get the kids to understand that each of those are rich and separate traditions. So it was important that we included some of the stars and the constellation names from Anishinaabe Mwen, so Maingananong, there are others, Ojikanong, there are Iwidnanong. There's a number of stars that would have been in our tradition. We're all looking at the same stars, but the little patterns that we see and the stories we tell about them reflect distinct different languages and cultures. So um, we were wondering about this page. I talked to Rachel recently. We have a friend at the school who's working on making a translation of this same story into Oneida and using almost all the same pictures, but he joked, he said, we might have to switch up those stars. So it'll be interesting to see as the project kind of moves, moves forward and evolves, but it's really nice to know that students um, who read the book can connect with their specific tradition. So because we're using Nishnab Mwen for this book, we have constellations that we hope their teachers then have long conversations about what we see in the night sky from an Anishinaabe perspective. And I'll scroll back up. Um, unless anybody has any questions about the starry night to make to get you to the swallows. That's crazy mazy. <laughs> Oops, I went too fast. Here we go. Yeah, so these, if people want to hear both, I mean, I can read both pages. What you'll notice is if you're someone who has studied our language, and since we have a, a small group and you know, we're gonna leave time for questions at the end, I'll say for those who don't know, I know there's a couple of people on this call who know it very well. Um, We've got everything from fluent speaker to proficient uh, beginning musician to teachers on the reservation. Um, what's unique about our language is we've got these four different verb types and two noun classes. So one of the things that we wanted to do is have kids get introduced to these concepts without being too overt. So we gave away 200 of these books in Milwaukee to kids who were anywhere from kindergarten up to eighth grade. And the eighth graders have talked about this in their grammar class by now, but the kindergartners and the younger, you know, beginning readers, they're just hearing these. So later when we talk about why would we talk about a car as an animate noun and talk about, you know, a ball or something else as inanimate, they've already got patterns in their head and examples of this. So we tried to make sure that some of the trickier things in our language that we know sometimes adult learners stumble over or find very different from English, we wanted to use those in the book in a way where we weren't focusing on it too much or making it a difficult concept. So you'll find things like obviation and transitive animate verbs, all kinds of things that linguists would love. Um, we had a lot of fun putting those into the book in a nice subtle way. So on these pages, you would realize that a car is in the animate class of nouns and that the verbs on the page with the swallows, it shows how we take one core verb and add uh, prefixes and suffixes to represent the pronouns. We don't have those as separate things. We also have words on these pages where the action that uh, being, in this case, birds are doing becomes what they are called. So there's a lot built into here that we wanted the kids to just soak up and enjoy <laughs> without being obvious at all. So I can read these two pages and then maybe the one after it. O dum tawan nimki. O dominotadiwak. O ba ja sha wanabise wak. O nzam gijibisawak. Wenje wa the bidden dua. And then another thing that we tried to do with Rachel's gorgeous art and her help and her sort of evocative imagination is to put in some real clan animals 
some mythic beings. We're pretty aware that we're not likely to see a uh, otter out in a canoe on the, you know, in the Bay of Milwaukee right now today. But, you know, I think that we all found it fun to imagine these two dogs out in a handmade birch canoe. And the Mishapishu, we certainly don't see the Mishapishu in this form, but we know those stories are really they, the same thing as the riptide. So I've worked with scientists who measure where along our shoreline there are riptides. And it's an important thing to keep in mind. Um, Alphonse and I worked with Guy Meadows, who's now a scientist up at Michigan Tech near the Keweenaw, um, you know, the Keweenaw Nation, but also the Keweenaw Peninsula there. Uh, and there are things about near shore currents that are, they are the same as the stories that we used to tell. So the fact that we have stories about this mythic being under the water that you should be very careful of, that lives near the shore, that lives near copper mines, that we should consider an animate warning of the, the weather and the, the landscape at the shore, that's something worth hanging on to. And seeing even a picture like this and being able to tell that story to the kids and say, well, you know, there's the mischief issue. We should be very careful when we go out to the shore. Um, is one way to keep in mind that right now Lake Michigan has more drownings than any of the other Great Lakes and the number one ethnicity uh, who pass away in these drownings is Native Americans right now. So what that tells us in some ways is that we lost some of our ability to retell these stories. We lost some of the traditional warning systems we might have had and you know, anything that we can do to kind of revitalize the whole culture, the stories, the science, the, you know, social systems that were there along with the language, not just, although I do love to translate things like green eggs and ham or little prince, there's the, those kind of translations are fun as well. But this book was really intended to fit into Anishinaabe culture and reflect Anishinaabe ideas. Um, so these, these pages, um, I'll read just like the one on the left, maybe. Nimki gae nala, which ke win in dewok. On god nong, nimki gae nala, Ottawa dewok, not way zebing. Ayana wan oshki jiman. Onje, minawana go jawak, jiman, initagwak, debishko, jim shin. So, another fun little thing. You can end this book having learned how to say, kiss me. So there's one you should all try with your microphones off at home. Jim Shin means kiss me. Um, so just actually playing with our language and having that kind of fun with it and getting kids to just think about the language in a complex way, but not one that seems hard to them or focuses too much on understanding all the parts at first. That, that was our main goal with the book. Now we're already, I don't know almost to 2.30 soon, we might want to take questions. I don't know. <laughs> I want yeah, to just, wait. Go ahead, Stacy. I just wanted to pop in and say that this picture here with the umbrella is one of my, my very favorite illustrations in the book. Stacey, they're Which, all, they're all my favorite. favorite. <laughs> 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 to go, Bobby. <laughs> Stacy loves all the images. I really do too. And for those who are interested in how books like this are made, um, Rachel Butson is an amazing illustrator on our Ojibwe.net page. We have uh, a little video clip that she had given us about how she came up with the images. People who know Nimki herself will recognize that these are just spot on exactly the, you know, the image of that dog. And that's what she started with. Stacy gave her a whole bunch of actual pictures and then she went from there and, you know, really turned it into a gorgeous book that I think anyone can see it's pretty fun. <laughs> yes, I want to allow people to ask questions. If you would like to just drop your na name in the chat box um, and you can unmute yourself when we'll just kind of go down the line. But just to start things off, um, I have so many thoughts in mind. First of all, of course, and other people have said it, the illustrations and artwork are just really, really beautiful. And I think you know, they're a testament between those and what you've spoken about the language and wanting to immerse children in the language without like giving them too much to try and figure out is it just proves like there's so much that goes into creating a children's book. I think there's this, um, you know, idea sometimes that it would be easy to just write a children's book and draw some pictures, but 
it's not true with any, and especially not with this one, because this one, as you're saying, is so much more important. Uh, I had no idea about those statistics about Lake Michigan. And um, yeah, it, it's just another reminder about the work that you and Stacy are doing is so critical. So I just wanted to ask about, I, what drew me to this book was the fact that it was written by an indigenous woman, illustrated by an indigenous woman, published with um, Wab Ajijak, mm -hmm. not sure, press, and then, which is an indigenous press, and then translated by an indigenous woman. So it, it gives a special quality to this book. And um, I would love to hear a little bit more about that collaboration. You, you shared a little bit about you know, doing the artwork, but um, is this part of a series of books? Is this, um, you know, a project that you want to continue doing other things together? Um, how does it, how did it work for you? You want me to take that one, Stacey? Okay. Yeah, you should probably talk about the other books that came first and everything. Yeah, it is interesting. Um, I think that to me, it is part of a larger landscape. So for instance, when I was young, there was nothing like this at all. And by the time I was a teenager at the Indian Center, there were things that people had typed up and maybe put on one of those mimeographs that smelled good when it was freshly printed, you know? And we didn't have anything that looked to us like a real kid's book. Um, kids' books were in our library at school or things that we maybe had, you know, at home but we didn't see Ojibwe this way. And so I think that really after the Native American Languages Act and in the mid 1990s, when it was finally a legal thing for people to do because up until sadly, up until the early 1990s, it was illegal for people in the US to be publishing in indigenous languages, hard to believe, but true. And I think then in the early 2000s, there really has been an explosion of little projects like this. And they're often very regional, very local. And you'll find a group of people, either teachers, artists, um, folks that are at a very grassroots level wanting to create things for the people around them who they teach. And I've just seen it get progressively more sophisticated, just stunning um, things, the things that come out now, it's really, it's nice to see. And so we were so lucky to have a grant from a local foundation in Milwaukee to be able to actually have kids take this book home. I've heard from some parents, they've read it five or six times already, you know, but we really wanted it to feel like this is the same as any other kids books, you know, that you would get. So it's not from Scholastics, but I think it's just as beautiful as, you know, I remember as a kid doing those scholastic orders, you know, <laughs> Jim Shin, huh? <laughs> Stacy's got some kissing going on in her screen there. Um, so Wabajijak Press is, uh, was started by Cecilia Lapointe, who many people would know as an activist in the uh, Northern Michigan region. She works on many different uh, causes in Anishinaabe country. And these books uh, actually were each started because in one case she wanted to write a story about pollution and her own clan, she's Crane Clan. And then the next one is a story about her cat named Bijou. <laughs> and so it seemed very natural to have the story of Stacy's dog, Nimki. Um, if I could totally embarrass Stacy, Stacy, go back to the picture at the very beginning where it's dedicated to your mom. We should share that. Uh, I think it's part of the story here because to take it one level further, uh, it was inspired by Stacy's mom. And so that brings yet another woman into the picture there. She's, there's, there's little Stacy, diaper and all. <laughs> but we wrote up her, uh, her dedication to her mother as well in Anishinaabe. And, and I think that's just something a lot of us didn't think we'd see in our lifetime. Books with our language, a way to thank our mothers and grandmothers and all the ones before us, our teachers like Alphonse, who's with us here today, um, it's just really nice to see that these things are kind of taking off. It meant a lot to me to be able to include this dedication to my mom um, in here because she's always been nothing but 100% supportive. I think I realized that I won the mom jackpot. <laughs> and the next book is going to be about crazy Maisie who just gave me way too many kisses. <laughs> <laughs> 
so Margaret and Stacy, did is it? Um, I know we met beforehand, and I seem to remember that you said that if you go to Ojibwe.net, there is a place where you can listen to it being read as well. Is that on the website or? Yeah, yeah could share, share? Um, let me share a new screen here. Yes, yeah, yeah. Stacy had me read every single line till I got it perfect. We did <laughs> pause between lines because I don't think I could have read the book straight through. <laughs> and I will say for those who are listening, this is definitely in Western Ojibwe, which sounds a little slower and has maybe some extra longer vowels, um, partly because we've watched as our elders can communicate with one another easily across dialects. So it's good. On, on Ojibwe.net, we have examples of both dialects. Um, primarily, think people think of it as Eastern and Western dialect. And what I find is that the Western dialect begins about at Chicago. And if you drew a line straight from Chicago to the Sioux up in Northern Michigan, which would be obviously not a straight line, but an angered, angled line, um, everything that is North and West from the Sioux and Chicago, so all of Wisconsin and, and part of Michigan's UP is Western dialect. And so the kids that were our main target audience for this book are the kids in Wisconsin and Minnesota. But a lot of folks in, in Michigan and Ontario can easily read it. Um, it's the same to them. It might just seem like there's extra vowels here and there. And we always choose words a little differently too. There's times where we might have said a phrase one way and somebody over in Ontario uh, might have said it a little bit different, but that's the delight of the language. So I hope there are some folks finding this and reading it in wiki and then saying the lines their own way too. I mean, it should be just an inspiration for people to, to play with it. And here's um, some color, there's coloring sheets that Rachel included. This is Nimkina Sugarbush that you can download from this page. There's a link to sing Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. This is the video that we talked about where Rachel is illustrating Nimki. And then we've also been working on this reader's guide, which just talks about things like, where is this language spoken? What makes it, what do we think makes it special? Um, how did Nimki get her name? And then why the book's organized by season. So just things that people have been asking about, we've been trying to you know, put thoughtful answers in here. So if somebody was teaching about this book or wanted to include it in their class or just to share it with somebody to give them, you know, we don't want to have the expectation that everybody knows all these things. Um, so it's a chance to share that information, but all of that's available on this Nimki page. I put a link in the chat. And, and like Margaret said, you can listen to the full audio of the book if you want to try seeing the words. There's also a word list here for some of like the, you know, the key, the keywords that are in the book, you know, the animals and, and different things like that. We're trying to make it very teacher friendly um, in Wisconsin uh, the, as a result of some treaty arrangements. Uh, there was a Supreme Court case that requires all of the public schools to teach uh, the local indigenous history and treaty rights and some of the culture. So something like this teachers can use. We wanted to give them all the tools. So even if you were a non-native teacher that had encountered Ojibwe for the very first time, you could pick up a book like this and be able to click on some of the audio and hear it or have ways to talk with kids that fit. Um, like I said, it's, it's a project that we did with that school. So we tried to even sort of scaffold it and connect it to some of the other lessons. So it would be age appropriate for really it's targeted around the maybe second to fourth grade. Um, but obviously little kids love hearing stories and all of the older people that we know have found a child in themselves and had fun reading, reading it too. I have a coworker who read the book and him and his wife had been kind of debating whether or not they should get a dog. And he sent me an email and said, this book made me decide that we should get a dog. I thought, uh oh, that's a lot of responsibility on, <laughs> on us for helping somebody make that important of a life decision. But I was thinking it would be really cool if all of a sudden I hear about lots of dogs named Nimki out there because of this book. <laughs> so people, I see there's a link to purchase the book so they can just go to ojiboy.net and click there. Is that correct? I think if they go to Wabajijak right now, here's the crazy thing. I think that right now it is sold out because uh, Cecilia printed 
think we did an initial print run of 600 and it sold out. The other two are available for sure still. And I actually have some copies. So we only have 13 people here that would not overwhelm me. Um, <laughs> I know at least a couple of people on this call have already gotten the book. <laughs> so if anyone that's on the call really, really wants one, I would say, you know, send me an email and I can either arrange for you to send a check and I'll send you a book or something, you know, we can figure it out because I, I think I have the remaining copies. It's very likely that we'll put it back into print because Cecilia and I have had a lot of fun other summers going to language camps and powwows and actually reading the book with kids is just the most rewarding thing. So, you know, we're, we're hoping that we have another print run as soon as we're all off of the quarantine and, and out in the world having language camps again. I also used it with my students um, at the university. So it, in the second year class where they know all the grammar and these should be familiar phrases, it was a nice way to read a book together and then have conversations because our second year class, they're at the level where they, they have to just try the entire hour to just speak in Anishinaabe one. And so when we read a book like this and then talk about that book, it gives them something focused to talk about as opposed to just asking each other, did you do homework? Are you hungry? <laughs> Which is what my students will typically just ask each other unless I give them a little short story like this or something to start with and then serve as a conversation point. I wanna say that I just saw Alex's question in the chat and this is, one of those things where like this is so upsetting I that if somebody has ever made you feel like that you don't have that you shouldn't learn this language I always tell people like this is the first language of Michigan you know because I'm, I'm here in Michigan and I try to give them that perspective of this is the language of this place and I think it should be accessible to anybody who wants to learn it I can't imagine somebody telling me I can't learn Spanish, you know what I mean? Like, um, but I have heard people say comments like this is a sacred language and, and maybe being trying to exclusive. Um, but I, I always feel like that's our way of sort of being perpetuating violence upon ourselves. But I don't know, Meg, if you want to say anything else. About yeah, that. I think for Anishinaabe and when, um, you know, the other fun thing, if we're just sharing things, Stacy, you could pull up the recent map that we did to show people how many communities there are around the Great Lakes that actually have this language as their heritage language. It's stunning. It's amazing. It's clear that the Anishinaabe were people who walked around with the map makers and wanted to have the language used. I think that what's worth noting, so you see all these green dots, these are individual communities right now, as of 2020, that Anishinaabe one is their heritage language. The map's interactive, so you can click on them and learn more about each community. But there are some languages, Algonquian languages even, like Menominee, where historically the Menominee, it's pretty, I mean, most people agree on this, there may be you know, a Menominee or two who has a different story, but, um, most of the people that I know up on the Menominee Reservation who are revitalizing the language and the way that we talk about it in Wisconsin, which is the home of the Menominee Nation, um, their language, they do keep a little closer. And in fact, even thousands of years ago, it's possible that when they went to trade, they used Ojibwe. So a lot of people feel that Anishinaabemwin or Ojibwe uh, was kind of the lingua franca, the, the words uh, that were most common if traders showed up or if people were trading and meeting together in places. So the tradition of Anishinaabemwin being learned by people who were not ethnically full Anishinaabe goes farther, farther back than colonialism. But I think that it's worth noting, you might run into people who say, I really just learn it to go to ceremonies and you know that's where it's at. But we, everything we put on our website is to, we would like to convert everyone to speak in Anishinaabe when, if we could. <laughs> we think it should be the second language of the Midwest, uh, you know, maybe the first in some places. Obviously, I think there's even some nations that have taken uh, the measure of in some of these nations that you see on this map, they have declared it the first language of their nation. And that would put English or other languages as second. So we, we put things on our site to be used and shared and enjoyed. Yeah, and um, I, I'd like to just pop in too um, about Alex's question. Margaret and I have worked together in the past on different projects and I had the opportunity to go with her to a language conference in um, Canada. A couple of, was like 
two years ago, I guess, almost two years ago now. And, um, and I knew really nothing besides um, Ani and Miigwech and that was about it. And so I was very, very nervous about going in there um, with similar feelings, Alex, of thinking, what if I do something wrong? What if I, you know, whatever. And I can tell you that I was so welcome there. And I think if you show a genuine willingness to learn, then you can't really go wrong because, um, you know, the, the, what I've learned from Margaret and working with her and what I think is important about this book too is that it, it's an opportunity to bring different communities together, no matter what our heritage is, to learn about the history of place, which is a big um, factor in who we are as a person, whether or not that's our particular heritage. And so, um, you know, that's being willing to learn and, and, you know, doing the best we can in that way, I think is, from my opinion, it feels like um, that, that for me is where I, I got the, the most welcome feeling of just showing up, basically, is what I'm trying to say. I think too, you know, we are all about sharing things. I mean, Ojibwe.net, Wabajijak, these are nonprofit efforts. So if someone were to say, I really want to create a version of this book in wiki dialect or, you know, in a different orthography using syllabics or something, we would be happy to help them do that, give them the PDFs, help them alter it. So a lot of these efforts, because it's not at a big publisher, we can be more nimble with that and we can help people just get the language out in the world or adapt it so that it fits their school or their space. Um, I saw the other question on the, about putting, um, Vanessa had asked what goes into putting the culture on the page. Um, I mean, I think that actually was very interesting because we had a lot of calls um, between the artist and Stacy and myself as the translator, sometimes there were things where I could see that there was an opportunity to include even more. Um, we started out with a kernel of a story. It was just a seed at the start. And then we added a little bit more to it. And then we'd have a call. And then maybe Rachel would do an illustration that would cause us to change the sentence a little bit more or add to that. So it really was a back and forth for a couple of months where the story took a shape that reflected what people wanted to share. So it was really all of us talking about what we were comfortable sharing, what we knew our each of our communities would find fun to share. Nothing that's in here is anything that people would be offended was on the page. There isn't anything um, that's uh, sacred in that way. There are some things that we, you wouldn't want to put in a book, but none of those things are here in this book. So we actually had a lot of back and forth to see what we would decide. I think too that, you know, you everything always has its context and Meg and I and, and Alphonse actually were all part of a language table for a long time in Ann Arbor. So I think we all have a familiarity of like where people start when they're learning about the language and like what appeals to them. And there also there was, I don't know if it's still online, but for a long time, there was a website called um, Mishnabe Da, maybe I can't remember for exactly, but Kenny Pheasant's website that had some learning materials on it. Um, and they think it gave you a chance to learn different nouns and things from the medicine wheel kind of approach. So we were like aware of what's out there already. And that was one of the things that happened actually is the book was originally written as an introduction to um, Ojibwe words. Um, and then Margaret had the point, you know, the idea of there's, there's lots of those at this point in time now, like we've reached a point in the Ojibwe canon where there's plenty of books that will give you a chance to learn some keywords here and there. Let's do something different. Let's just make it completely bilingual. So there's like all these different ways that the, that the book evolved and grew just from us working together and like being in the context that we're in, I guess, in the moment that we're in. I'm also looking at the note that Judy just put in the chat. Can you go to the last page, Stacy? If she's got a two-year-old granddaughter listening, one of the things that I love that Stacy put at the end of the book, one of the most useful phrases, um, is it easy for you to go back to the last page? Um, we've talked a lot about well-being and people being happy and how we can be resilient. And a lot of that depends on making sure we all know how to say nizagabis, 
gezagen, the fact that we can say, I love myself or I love you, those are really important phrases to learn early and learn to say them often. So this one has, a, I love that this is how the book ends. Banama bebikan e jewebzo en nimki shibongwashi. Nimki shibongwashi be sho ishkodeng. Anindi wa shibongwashian. Minoguaman gizage in. And I have to say, Alphonse taught my girls to say minoguaman a long time ago. They're in their 20s now. I still get a, a text in the evening. I know Guaman. <laughs> so I think sometimes those little phrases that you can learn and insert into your family's conversation instead of English sometimes can be things that people really hang on to. So just ending the book with phrases that any adult could start to share with a kid like Mino Guaman, Izagin. Those are things that we really wanted to make sure we had for just like the situation that uh, Judy's describing with the little one who's just listening. And I liked this because I like to take my dog on adventures and they always end in the same scene. And actually you can see her behind me now. The adventure of coming here results in a nap. <laughs> so Margaret and Stacy, I'm just wondering um, you know, we're still deep in the COVID world, and I know that there have been in-person groups that would meet for learning the language. Are there places that we can go online now to participate in language learning besides Ojibwe.net? Doesn't Tony Troyer have a language table that we shared on Facebook? Yeah, there are language tables all over, just more and more. I feel like that's that's something I see even more as well. So actually Michigan State University, um, Stacy and I just don't care. We co um, collaborate with any university that we can, any school, tribal school, tribal college. Um, and right now, uh, Michigan State University is compiling a list of resources. And one of the things that the person who's working on the project with us has found is a list of, I think Ellie had something like 25 different places that people were getting together online to use the language. So we'll have that resource list up on Ojibwe.net in kind of coming months with other, you know, dictionaries, curriculum, all kinds of resources. But uh, you also can find a lot on Facebook. Um, if people really, I get a lot of emails. I direct an institute called the Electiquini Institute for American Indian Education in Milwaukee. And I get a lot of emails uh, just asking for either translations or connections like that to different language tables. We're always happy to help people find something that might be near whatever city they're in. I would typically say, start with Facebook because a lot of us language folks are kind of old school. We do have an Ojibwe Dot net or it's really Ojibwe underscore net on Instagram, which is primarily run by my brilliant daughters who have had Alphonse as a professor at Michigan. Um, but the, you can find something, I think, at any generation level and, and pretty much all over the Great Lakes. Sorry, I'm just trying to gather links to drop them in the chat box. Um, oh, I see Vanessa's question too. Um, can I say something real quick? Yeah. I think this would, we should talk about, speaking of the language sounding musical, one of my favorite, my favorite Ojibwe word to say, I think is Kijikijikaneshi, which is Chikiti. <laughs> and Margaret actually has written a song um, about a Chikiti that goes with a book that she wrote. And actually I'll pull up the, the Chikiti page while Meg talks about the musical quality. <laughs> of the language. We, we have a small that. group here. I have colleagues on this call who are our fellow poets and fellow musicians. Um, with Petra, I was part of our um, Miskwasening Nugamojik sang with us so frequently. Um, I know I've been up in spaces where Judy has been singing. And then Sheila Feshaw, who's on this call, is a music educator, a professor that I met working in Milwaukee now several years ago. But we have been making sure that the language and song that we put on the website for learning, whenever possible, we add what people might need to be able to sing it. I'll, I'll share this one with you. Yeah, it's probably true we wouldn't get through an hour without me singing something, right? <laughs> but this one we put in here, um, 
the words that we really wanted folks to learn. Gijigijiganeshi is a fun word. It's the word for chikiri, and it is one of those words that reflects the sound of a being. Um, did you want to add something, Alphonse? I saw you turned your, you unmuted yourself. Or are you going to sing with us, Alphonse? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> and there's things in here we put like on kobijigan, on kobijiganak, on a kobidowat. So this on a kobidu, that idea that those sounds have a particular meaning that carries from one word to another, it teaches us things about the way our language is built. But then it also, if you have to learn a song and you find a little tune to go with it, it absolutely, as it was just mentioned in the chat, it's a good way to remember them. Um, so I can sing this one if people want to, you know, I don't know how it works if we all sing along or do we just like leave ourselves muted. I, I, I've learned in Zoom world, I don't really care. So sing along if you want. I can do it twice just so that you hear it once and then you can join in the second one. Get your get your ganeshi, a yagawanda, noon dog of zit, noon demi young gidwa, mana do ke young, mana do we young. Now you all know it, so you can try it. Even if you're muted, no one will know, but it's like you might as well try it, right? Anako bitchigana, Anako bidu what, wing gosh, wind and maui young gidwa, gosh could be chicken. Gagashka king. Get you get you ganeshi. Hey, I go on duck. Noon dog is it. Noon demi young gidwa. Mana do ke young. Mana do we young. And we have on here um, so people can listen to the audio and try it later. There's There are a lot of songs that we put on here. Some of them are for times in life, times that you are doing a thing and you need a song to go with it. There are a few that we put on here simply to help people remember something. Vishka Kamikwe helps people remember the directions. There's a few that Sheila and I have written to help people remember things like, how is it, if you have two types of nouns, how do you remember a thing is in one place if it's in a, a particular category versus another? The way we would say a bird is in a place versus the way we would say a sandwich is in a place is different and teaching people those noun classes is important too. So we have um, under, I think that's under children's songs. If you go to children's songs, if Stacy's poking around here navigating, right? So under children's songs, we've got a lot of learning songs. And I think, yeah, so the difference between 10 little apples on the tree and 10 little pumpkins in the field is that apples in our language are in the animate classification. So the way that you would say an apple is somewhere, you can click on that one, click on like the apple one or the pumpkin, it doesn't matter, this one's fine. And we've got the music there too. So if a music educator or somebody who's in a classroom in a school where they want to say, let's learn you know, another language, this is a really, it's a neutral little song that anyone who's teaching music might wanna play with and, and actually learn a bit about. But if you're teaching the language to know the difference between this way I walk. So you're counting along and the aya is different than if you said ate or atenon, you know. So knowing that you're talking about apples versus pumpkins, um, you can, it's another thing where you can just get that noun class thing in your head by singing. That way it makes it much easier. I've known adults who get frustrated learning later in their life and they say, well, why is an apple in one category and a pumpkin in another? Um, no reason really. I mean, a lot of languages have different characteristics and not all of them can be explained. You just have to learn them. Last year I was working um, at a digital digital agency and for Indigenous Peoples Day we did this really nice thing where uh, um, all these people I worked with who are distributed across the United States and Canada who don't really know anything about Anishinaabe Moyne all tried to say Happy First People's Day in Anishinaabe Moyne, which is Minona Tamba Madzijik Wigijigat. And I noticed that a couple of people who are musicians who kind of put that to a rhythm and a beat to break it down and to be able to say it, could just say it so fluently and easily 
Um, and whereas other people struggled, you know, with kind of like how overwhelming that phrase looks if you don't break it down or give it a rhythm in some way. So I, I really agree. Like even Gidja Gidja Ganeshi, I always hear mixed voice in my head whenever I say that word. I think the music helps a lot with being able to pronounce some of these or just even because the words become so large, I guess they look, they look intimidating, helps to break it down. That's true. I think every now, even now, every time I say Sugatagabo, I hear Alphonse's voice <laughs> to step outward. You know, there's beautiful words in our language. And when we can learn those words and what they mean, Zagatagabo, you know, Zaga, that Tagabo, it's that way of going out into an opening. It reminds you of all the things that relate to that word, you know, and, and you hear them. We carry language in us uh, in songs and stories. So. It's nice to have a way to share it. Thank you. I love um, being able to, you know, go through the Ojibwe.net. I I've seen I've been on that website before, but it seems like there's a lot more on it than the last time I was there, and it's just rich with so much great information. Um, I have to yeah. say, app is our newest project, and Margaret has really written some beautiful stuff here about this project and sort of the landscape of the Great Lakes and the watershed. If, if you have an opportunity to check out this map, um, it's one of our, our newest additions to Ojibwe.net. Yeah, it's very cool. So is there, um, is there a, or what is the website that you can go to where you learn about each area where you're standing so that you can honor the land and the people who were there? There's a website where you, that tells you um, all of that information. Do you know what that is? The native lands map is probably the yeah, one. Yeah, that's interesting. We have opinions on that. I know you're running out of time. <laughs> I would I would love to hear your opinion. Yeah. Well, our thoughts on that. This um, adventure of creating this map. I mean, I think we live in a world now where the digital is both where we play and where we work. I see my daughters moving in and out of TikTok and Instagram, but wanting to use their language. So on our Instagram account on Thanksgiving afternoon, because our family was separated, my daughter sat down and we took a poem that I had in Irish, the language of Irish, which is also being revitalized. And we put it in Ojibwe and made it a song, you know, like, so that's their way of playing. But it's also, I think that a map like this one, which people ask me about frequently, this map is layers and layers of time. So you can go to a place, for example, just to like explain it a little bit. If I go to what is Milwaukee now and I click on what is Milwaukee now, this map shows historic presence. We don't, we don't have those nations right now represented in Milwaukee. So the students on my campus, so yeah, if you even just look there, Stacy. The Ocheti Shikawan is west of us. The Mayama, Menominee is north. Uh, Oroatame, uh, you have north of us and in that city and also all around to the south and to the east of us, the Peoria, the Kickapoo. These are nations who were in this area differently at different stages of time. There are people who are in this space now like the Oneida, um, the Stockbridge Muncie, who aren't shown on this map. And so I often advise people, the best thing to do is to really get to know wherever you are because this map kind of jumbles time and it shows a lot, but it's not perfectly accurate to, to where you are right now. Like it didn't mention the Ho-Chunk, it didn't mention you know, the Stockbridge Muncie. There are 12 sovereign nations in Wisconsin. And so if you wanted to know who to recognize right now, it would be a different set than what's on there. Um, our map is really just biased by our language. We tried to trace all the places that we know Anishinaabe when it's spoken. Um, and then we, we noticed that, and Alphonse has talked about this before, on our map, what we tried to do was show what these nations say is the history of their own name. In some cases, they will say what their name is in English, and they have a very different name in Anishinaabe, and they translate it very directly. In other cases, they have an Anishinaabe one name. So like you see the Gun Lake Band of Potawatomi and Machibanashiwish, which is their exact spelling that they use, um, 
that doesn't say gun or lake or band or anything. The name that it remembers there is an individual, Mace Beneshe. And so we try to make real the history that many of these nations just have on their own website. But I think the US treaty name is often the only one that's remembered. So if you want to acknowledge um, the groups in your area, you, you kind of have to do a little digging and start with the sovereign presences right around you. And then you can work back in history as well, but you'd need to combine both. I guess that'd be my advice. Thank you. I, I'm glad that you shared that because, you know, um, and I've told people before, every time I meet with you, Margaret, I learn something new. And I, I love that because it's easy to um, just kind of bypass the details, you know, based on what you might see out in the general public and this, you know, I, I appreciate that you remind us that it jumbles time. That That's a great way to um, explain why it would not be as accurate. So I'm really, I, I love the map that you guys have developed and put up on your website. And maps are constantly changing, right? Maps are really just a story. So this group, Stacy and I contacted them when we started our map project. And um, I got to know some of the folks that run this and they recently created a predominantly indigenous board of advisors. So I'm guessing that this map will evolve as well and it will include more because that I wasn't the only one saying it. There were other indigenous groups saying, we don't see ourselves in the present on the map. We see history. That map is also a little biased. Um, it's more accurate to Canadian areas than the US and they felt that they wanted help. So they were happy to hear from Stacy and I on that front. So yeah, everything is, you know, it's all an evolution, I guess. Old things come back around and everything moves forward. Since Alphonse is here, we'll click on Quimcon. No, I don't know. You're not sharing now. I'm Are not? Sure? No, oh. no. Well. What, what did you say? <laughs> she said she was going to go on the map and click on Wikwemakon. <laughs> oh, I'm not, I'm not from Wiki, though. What? Mm. I, I'm from uh, Wikwemakon. Wikwem Kongsing, even yeah. a smaller specific part of Wikwem Kong unceded <laughs> First Nation. <laughs> uh, Molly Jona was, uh, and I were uh, teasing each other one time. He says, I'm going to go looking for you at Kaboni. <laughs> you will be there. <laughs> so you're going to be looking forever. Because <laughs> that's not where I'm from. <laughs> Well, um, it's a little after three. So of course, if there's anyone else who wants to ask another question or make another comment, please feel free to do that. Um, the last thing I wanna just ask is, other than purchasing the book, sharing information about the press and the book and sharing information about Ojibwe.net as well as exploring it, what is there another way that we can contribute? Is there a place where, um, Maybe we can offer donations because you said you're a nonprofit or anything that we can do to help um, continue the work that you're doing. Well, I guess, I mean, I'll just try and give it a short answer. I mean, I would say first for people to um, work with the folks that are closest to them. I mean, most of what we do, the goal is for people to use the language, to sing some of the songs. I mean, no amount of money is more valuable than actually knowing that each one of you might get someone to sing one of the songs on the site, right? <laughs> so, so we would want that before anything. Okay. Um, the Electa Quinney Institute had funded the production of this particular book. So when people on the Electa Quinney Institute at UWM, if people want to work with us in that way, um, they can. We did actually have one uh, uh, foundation give us money to do another book soon. So you know, people can, if they want to funnel money into native publishing, by all means, I'm happy to help people do that. There's also ways though, wherever you are, that you can just be a, an ally for the language, be an advocate, use the language, whether you're native or non-native. If you're in Michigan, it makes sense to use it. And that way people like Alphonse who are fluent speakers start hearing it all around in places you don't expect. And that, you know, that really would be our goal. But I want to just say that, you know, the Miigwech, Wininim, Gakinawea, Bizindawayik, it's just been a real treat. This is such a nice group to have assembled in the afternoon to see 
that even in some cases, it's more than one person. Um, we saw two in Petra's box a moment ago, and it's really fun to think of Judy there with her granddaughter. And, you know, I appreciate everybody taking time out of their day to, to be with us a bit. Yeah, thank you so much for being here, for both of you being here. Um, Alex is asking if there's any contact information that um, they can give their beating circle um, in her area. So if you've got any information there, or if there's a, if, if there's something in the, um, on the website that might be? Yeah, on Ojibwe.net, on the About Us page, we've got contact information. And the way Stacy set up that map was beautiful because in better days, I travel a lot. Um, even now I do a lot of Zoom things like this and she's made it so that I could be in a setting like this. I have her with me here, so I would have backup. But I told her I want to be able to add something if someone tells me right then and there, you don't have my nation or you don't have my name right, you know, so we can update it. So we have our contact information on Ojibwe.net. I mean, my email is just newton at uwm.edu, but pretty easy to find. So if people have anything they want to add to that map or they see, um, there were some nations that literally when I contacted the nation, mostly in treaty territory in Ontario, they said, we don't know the name that would have been used here. There were a few. And so if we find any more information, we are happy to add it immediately. And it'll, you know, refresh and update and, and continue to be more and more accurate all the time. Great. Well, Big Witch, thank you for the work that you do. Um, I'm so happy to see you and hopefully we can see each other in person um, sometime soon. I'm, I really all be at a powwow next summer. <laughs> yeah, I love doing these Zoom meetings because I get to uh, meet people like Stacy. I don't know that I would have really been able to meet you in person as easily. So it's really wonderful to be able to gather online. But I certainly look forward to being able to um, to meet in person at, at one point in time. So thank you everyone for being here, and um, the recording again will be available on our Hidden Timber books YouTube channel. So um, keep an eye out for that and you can share it with your friends and then take a look at hiddentimberbooks.com and um, you know look for some some more readings coming down the line. We've got lots of people lined up through 2021 through March. So it's gonna be gonna be a lot of fun, but I appreciate you all being here and be sure and check out Ojibwe.net. And again, thank you, Margaret and Stacy. Yes. yes. Alfonso, it's wonderful to see you. Bama P.